Hey guys, this is Elise. Welcome back to this project and online series of events, Catholic Christian Friends for Intersectional Racial Healing. Today, uh, I will be introducing one of my very good friends and the, one of the panelists, Keith. So happy to have you here. Hey. <laughs> Um, so, you know, my fingers disappear in the virtual background. I'm sorry. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but Keith is all there. And um, <laughs> so today, this is a pretty special, and one of the, one of the, all of the introductions are very special for me to make, but this one's also very special because recently I gave a public testimony at the Ohio State House about how racism is a public health concern and um, gave a story about uh, a violent experience that I had that I had to go to court for, um, racial violence. And Keith was there as one of my wonderful friends to support me. And so I'm just so excited for others to get to know you and to share conversation in this area. So um, my first question for this conversation, this video is what got you interested? What got you to be involved in this project? Well, uh, you know, mainly, um, you know, I just wanted to be able to just help out and say, hey, you know what, you're, you're my friend, you're interested in this project and talking. I often don't try to talk about racism, um, you know, not overtly uh, anyway in trying to address things. Uh, but I was like, well, you know what, I'll go ahead and help you out because you're my pal. Oh, thanks so much. And you're a great friend. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate that. It takes a lot of vulnerability and, and, so much thought and intention to go into this kind of conversation. And so I just really appreciate that you're doing it with me. Um, what are you hoping that other people will get out of this project, whether they're the viewers or other panelists? Uh, I don't have any expectation. I'm not here to place a judgment on any, on any one person or think about any certain thing or have any expectation what somebody's gonna get from this. I'm just here to just share and then, you know, move on. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for that generous and open intention. Um, so you, however, will owe me a kidney at some point in the future. A kitty? A, a kidney. You know what? I might actually have a hookup for that. I might be able to get you one. From, from it's not for me. It's for a friend. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. <laughs> for your friend, for you, whatever. All the cats for everyone. All right. right, right. So, um, yeah, let's, so I'm thinking, you know, to help other people get to know you, because I've known you for now, like, close to 10 years, and, oh, wow. yeah. um, you know, because we met that, that day at the art show with, with Josh, Yes. and, um, yeah, that was about, that's close to 10 years ago, so, uh -oh. anyhow, I, you know, I have had the pleasure of having friendship with you for such a long time, and I'd love for others to get to know you a bit, and, um, you know, since this is, a conversation about racial experience. Um, would you mind sharing a, a moment of, um, of your life where you experienced ra racial things intersecting with your life and where you were and what's going on? Yeah, sure. So I don't know how much the internet can tell, but I'm a devilishly handsome African American. Um, at this point in my life, I like to tell stories, usually through comedy and humor, about those persons who are kind of raging against the status quo, which goes back to a lot of the experience that I've had in my life, um, you know, here in the U.S., um, you know, with the world basically telling me who I needed to be to fit their own expectations, which is not something that I recognized until way, way further in my adulthood. And one thing that actually, at least you don't even know about me, is that I didn't even live in the continental United States until I was about uh, 11 years old. So I lived in a place called St. Thomas. Do you know where that is? I don't. <laughs> okay, you go to, oh, no problem. A lot of people don't. A lot of people don't even know it's part of the US, including our president. So if you go to Puerto Rico, right? You know where Puerto Rico is? Yeah. Okay, turn left. You know, okay. you'll, you'll reach those islands eventually. And I lived on the island of St. Thomas until I was about, uh, you know, 10 years old. My mom like, brought us up from St. Thomas all the way up into Ohio, um, mm -hmm. you know, for, so she could work on her graduate degree. So I'm new to the area. And that, ta that time, you know, mom would just like send you to the store and get something and come back. And just there's a little corner market that was there. And this was one of like the first times I had experienced racism and I didn't even know what was going on. So, uh, so the story goes, it's like my mom, it's, 
it's nighttime um, and it's dark enough that you can't see everything around you. So maybe about eight or so in the summertime, my mom sends me to go to the corner market to pick up something for her. And so I walk out and the way that the house was is that there's a house and then there's this big open spot and then there's an alleyway that comes walk goes across it so i'm just walking 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 and then a police car pulls up and a light shines in my face and i can't see anything that's in the light i just keep walking and it's not until i get really really close to the car that i see that the police officer had had you know not only the light out but his gun out and he looks at me and he says did you want me to shoot you and i'm like and i didn't it didn't even you know register with me and he just looked at me again, like, did you want me to shoot you? Like, he kept walking and, and it didn't even, I just didn't even think like, well, what do you mean? I wasn't doing anything wrong, right? But then he just, you know, turned off his light and then drove off. Now, I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know how. Um, and, and quite honestly, I don't, I, I, I'm very, as I reflect right now, um, I'm very much thankful to realize that, you know, I'm still alive because, you know, this is, uh, there are so many people who did not have that experience. Um, you know, you think of a Tamir Rice who didn't even have, you know, when the cop pulled up, didn't even have a second or so to react as he was playing with a toy gun and he turns and boom, he's already dead. Um, you know, I didn't have any weapons in my hand, but I also didn't see that there was a gun in my face. And when I did, I didn't even recognize that there was a gun in my face. Um, so, you know, that's the first thing that, that's the first real experience that jumps out, me, out at me when I think about racism. Um, and there are certainly many, many experiences later on, but that's the one that's kind of like, huh, I didn't even recognize what was going on. And kind of lucky that, uh, you know, that I didn't end up a hashtag. Oh my gosh. I mean, so wait, let's just back up a second. Um, how old were you? When I was 11 you, years old. You were 11 years old and a police, an adult, a grown adult is saying to you, do you want me to shoot you? What? Like, I'm, I mean, I'm sorry. I just have like, I, I just have like so many questions right now. Okay. Ask them. It's going in like a billion directions of, um, cause this is not a scripted conversation. So I'm, I'm kind right. of just like, you're my friend. My younger self is enraged and I'm like, we need all the kids in the town to like show up and be there with you. And you know, like, cause you're 11. So I'm thinking like my 11 year old self needs to be there with you. And oh my gosh. And, and you're right. Like the first time that any weapon of any kind is put towards our bodies it's just like what is that thing but it's also like that's a thing like that's that's a dangerous thing like it's just, just like such a jarring experience and um yeah so I'm first of all like I'm so I feel a lot of different ways right now about what you just shared because you're my friend and I also feel a lot of different ways about it because I'm human, you're human. So I'm having all these like human emotions right now and, and, and thoughts and it makes me feel really upset for you. Really upset with that grown adult, not even acting like an adult, just acting out so, of their mind. So this is where things, you know, get tough when you're like, okay, one of the things I work really hard to do is try to look at things from the other person's perspective. It doesn't always work out well that way. I mean, and I certainly do not agree with the other perspectives that happen, I mean, let alone with the gun to the face, right? But, but it helps you to kind of understand. If you imagine that this, this guy was somewhere, you know, driving around looking for some kind of perp, right? And imagine that, you know, I might have still, you know, I might have been that perp that he was, that he thought it might have been. He's still wrong. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. I know you thought I was going with some width of understanding. It's like, no, no, it was still, it was still, you know, it was still really wrong because I would have never known that. Guy didn't say anything. He just kind of like shined the light. And it was like, not until I got close that I realized, hey, something's up. And it's not until years later that I realized, hey, it was a serious threat. And, and by the way, if my mom finds out this is the first time she's hearing the story, I'm so sorry, Ma. <laughs> I totally, yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah. 
Never, huh. to, never told her because it didn't register with me. It's just like, and and a lot of times, you know, those early experiences, we're just like, okay, this thing happened. We move on. You know, we move through our day and we just get other stuff done. But that's what you have to do in order to not let yourself get absorbed by the entire world around you. Absolutely. Yeah. And also like, you know, cause I do therapy and things. I, I can't tell you how many times, like I would say the majority of the kids that I've ever worked with are like, they, they try to protect their own families, even though they're a kid. Like they try to protect their parents from feeling a certain kind of way. They try to protect. And it's like, you're a kid, you don't have a legal ability to do anything, but that's just like built into a lot of kids systems. It's like, I need to make sure that everything's okay at home. And I do my part and I don't want to become a burden and this and that. And it right. like compounds itself. So I have a follow-up question. Feel free to share as much or as little as you like, or if you're like, no, I don't like that question. We'll just, you know, move on to a different question. Okay. Um, like, you know, that's when you were 11 and you came from St. Thomas and came up here. I am curious, um, as you grew, did you, how, how did you, I guess there's two parts to my question. The first is like, what are some other experiences that you had that compounded on that first experience that started to register like a racial narrative of, ooh, race plays a really significant role in my life constantly. Um, that even set the stage for that 11 year old experience to happen. Um, and then the other one is, the other portion of it is, how did you process over time um, through adversities to, circling back to what you shared at the very beginning of this video, to then decide to respond with humor? Um, how? And again, if you don't like these questions, I can ask a new one, share as much or as little as you wish, because I know that this is a different forum than just like us talking, you know? So, yeah. yeah. I guess probably the easiest way to, or actually the most complete way to answer your series of questions is to know that, um, believe it or not, the gun in my face is not the worst experience that I've had with racism. It's one of the closest I've come to death but but it's not the one that has put you know that that has been um you know most effective or compounded on top of or just made me like hate the world but there have been enough experiences that for a time you know i the, the entire world around me you know was just getting two gigantic middle fingers um i mean the 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 humor portion really comes in um just because that that's part of my it's part of my personality um, and it's just because I, I think differently and I have been working from, you know, when you start out originally and you have your unique way of thinking and approaching the world, you know, at first it's embraced, then it's, uh, you know, shut down upon, and then you're trying to figure out a way to embrace your uniqueness, even while somebody else is shutting, shutting it down. Um, and, and I've worked very much to kind of get towards that. And that's where you see, you know, where I am now with trying to be as authentic as I can. But also if a joke pops in my head at the same time that I'm talking about stuff, I'm probably going to say it because I want to laugh and I don't want to get sucked down into thinking about the entire list of people who look like me, you know, who are, you know, no, who are now hashtags. Um, and, and, and it always like strikes it like the oddest point, like one of the, one of the other early experiences where the humor kind of pop, pops in is um, there was a time in which you could just like, as a kid, like you just walk to school by yourself, right? And mom was just like, you know, she just said, just go, just go do it. Um, and so I'm walking and I had gotten to this one point where I saw a sign on a wall that said, wait a minute, I can curse on this, right? Okay, just wanted to double check. All right, so, all right. You know, spoiler alert, cursing is going to occur here. He said, you know, and it said, on the wall, I look on the wall and I see a swastika and then I see fucking nigers go home. Now, I looked at the wall and, 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 and this is what I said, and I, I couldn't decide at which to be more offended. The fact that there was like, you know, the racial language 
or the fact that the person who wrote the language couldn't spell. <laughs> right. Right? Because I'm like, you know, who are the Nigers? Like, who is the Chinese Nigers? It's like, am I supposed to take this upon me simply because you couldn't <laughs> spell the word, the word directing your hate? And I'm like, you know, these are the things which, you know, hit in my mind. So, um, you know, I... It's, it's, and it's hard, it's, it's hard to do, it's kind of hard to do that if you try to like frame the world and try to look for the humor within tragic events. Like it doesn't, you know, things don't work that way. It's like, things are terrible, things are terrible. But if you happen to notice something about human behavior that, you know, it takes you a little bit left of center that allows you a chuckle in the moment, like, okay, you know, Great. Like, you know, for example, um, you know, uh, you may know Tucker, Tucker Carlson, right, who is this commentator on Fox News, used to be on CNN, but he's total right wing and, and spews racist hate all the time. Well, at the bottom of the, these newscasts where he does it, where you see like right about at this size of the screen is a thing called a, uh, it, it's a Chiron feed where they put like the titles of like news stories or where they say, um, you know, blah, 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 uh, you know, or news at five, uh, you know, two men shot here. Or this, and, well, Tucker, Carl <laughs> Tucker Carlson is on screen and he's showing and, and, he, and he's doing a bit on racism and the Chiron below him is like, what does racism look like? <laughs> so people froze the screen. <laughs> <laughs> just, just like, and, and they send this out over the internet now. It's like, when you meme yourself, because there he is. <laughs> you know, and all you can do at that is just laugh because it's like, look, this is authentically true. Here's a racist. Here's a segment. <laughs> Am I not supposed to laugh at you? Because you did, you know. You're the master race. You should have seen this coming. <laughs> <laughs> that is so fun. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's such a great tool for teaching. It's a great tool for resilience. It's a great tool for just breaking the ice um, and starting conversations. And um, yeah, Keith, thank you so much for sharing from your experiences. I just so appreciate it. Just sharing from your heart. You're a great friend. I'm so excited for you to share and to be in conversation with other friends of ours and um, really looking forward to all of this. So uh, for those who are viewing, please stay tuned and have a good rest of your day. God bless. Bye, Jeez.